Welcome everybody and thank you very much indeed uh, for coming to hear this year's senior thesis students read from their now finished projects. Um, a year ago, as you all know, so these seven students were about to begin their projects. Um, they were full, I'm sure, of confidence. Uh, they were, I spoke to many of them, they were going to get that reading wrapped up over the summer. They were going to have the project done pretty much by Christmas. Uh, and then, of course, the reality of writing a senior thesis really kicks in. I have a section on, my, uh, on the syllabus of the colloquium that we offer in the fall, which I title, It's November and I've started hiding from my advisor, Is This Normal? Uh, that, I think, is an inevitable part of the process. Um, but they all did a tremendous job. They all pushed through, which is testament to their own remarkable intellectual abilities, um, their grit and determination. But it's also testament to many of you in this room. It's testament to friends, to partners, to parents, to family members, uh, and of course also to the advisors. Um, and I know our seven uh, senior thesis students would want me to thank the advisors as well and everybody in the room for their support. So now we are going to have, each, uh, each one of the students is going to read a short excerpt from their project. Um, and I've asked them, just as they finish, also to reflect. If I could go back a year, what's the one thing I wish I'd known going in? Okay. So first of all, we have, is it Forrest? No, Jen, Jen, Jen Sager. Hello. <laughs> Um, for my thesis, I studied the rhetoric and language used to articulate gendered violence as communicated in hard-boiled crime fiction written between um, the 1930s and 1950s. I, um, I chose to study this genre um, specifically because the shifting gender dynamics after the Great um, War period lends, lended itself to a certain aesthetic of sexualized violence within hard-boiled fiction. I wanted to see how these depictions served as a precondition for our own time period as I uncovered consistencies and contradictions of post-war gender stereotypes articulated by traditionally canonical male writers and largely unread women writers of the hardball tradition. So um, in my first chapter, um, I looked at the hardball formula set up by three canonical hardball texts um, and attempted to uncover the meaning of traditional hardboiled masculinity. My second chapter investigated how women navigated the overtly masculine framework of this genre, what gender stereotypes um, they submitted to, and in what ways were they able to articulate an empowered woman in this typically patriarchal and misogynist misogynistic tradition. Um, so from here, I'll read a section from the introduction of my second chapter. Um, <coughs> In chapter one, the initial practice of the hard-boiled tradition is a commentary of maleness and masculinity. The hard-boiled genre is a space in American culture where masculine fantasies get a kind of hyperbolic and public elaboration. In this, er in this arena, implicitly gendered content of those fantasies are heightened and rendered explicit. A fantasy version of masculinity that defines itself against a femininity whose proximity demands that it be ambivalently repudiated. This femininity often returns with all the violence of the initial projection to proliferate, shatter, and dissolve the male ego. In this respect, the hardball tradition is a public articulation of gendered anxieties in a fantastical realm where pre-war gender ideology is resurrected. The novels examined in the first chapter embody a genre committed to masculine prowess while also struggling with male toxicity. One might, therefore, think of classic hardball fiction as a cathartic purging and collective exercising of explicitly gendered demons. Naturally, um, after looking at the traditional blueprint of the hardball tradition in the first chapter, my next question was to explore how women writers managed to infiltrate this overtly masculine tradition. In recent years, new attention has been given to women writers who have managed to infiltrate the tradition. Founded in 1970, the feminist press began as a crucial publishing component of second wave feminism reprinting feminist classics and providing much needed texts for the developing field of women's studies. In 2003, they began their project Femme Fatale's Women Write Pulp, which aimed to restore print the best of women's writing in classic pulp genres. From hardboiled noir to racy romance to taboo lesbian pulp, 
these rediscovered queens of pulp offered subversive perspectives at the heart of American culture. This series acknowledges the contradictory nature of women writers in the hardball tradition, given the tough guy image of pulp fiction, yet points out that these writers were able to accomplish the difficult task of outpacing their male counterparts in challenging, in challenging received ideas about gender, race, class, and forbidden territories, while still adhering to the conventions of the hardball genre. Bringing to light a collection of deep and astonishing hard-boiled texts written by women, the feminist press aggregated texts that showed the capacity of women to write from the male perspectives, narrating from inside the head of a serial killer, a PI, or a small town pharmacist who happens to know all the town dirt. They also wrote from places where women weren't supposed to go. By experimenting with America's mass-produced, easily dispensable texts, women writers used pulp as a medium to reflect and shape the heart of American popular imagination and the culture that consumed it. Whereas chapter one outlines a deliberate performance of active masculinity, both underlining and defining the hard boiled tradition, my second chapter showcases the hard boiled texts by female writers that experimented with the scripts of masculinity. In this comparison, I would like to I drew, drew from Gilbert and Gubar's infection of the sentence. Specifically, women writers of the hard boiled tradition are closely connected to a trend of literary theory that explores psychology of literary history, the tensions and anxieties, hostilities and inadequacies writers feel when, they feel when they confront not only the achievement of their predecessors, but the traditions of genre, style, and metaphor that they inherit from such forefathers. In a male-constructed and dominated canon, masculine versions of literary history deny women writers from fitting in. She is the anomalous, indefinable, alienated, and freakish outsider. Thus, these women writers infect the sentence, both abiding by rhetoric and conventions of the genre, yet impact the tradition in an experimental fashion. Whereas male writers constructed the femme fatale to shoot, seduce, and poison her way through pulp bestsellers as an iconic figure of evil whose objection secured a new masculine ideal, women writers created characters and used narrative techniques that agitated these customs within masculine hegemony. I'm going to use two exemplary novels produced by the feminist press and recently re republished and anthologized by the Library of America, Laura by Vera Casperi and In a Lonely Place by Dorothy Hughes. These novels rework and experiment with various performances of masculinity and femininity normalized within the genre. So I'm also going to re read um, the concluding paragraphs of my project. Um, when Dashiell Hammett made his brutal private eye, Sam Spade, an American folk hero in the Maltese Falcon, he also created a cruel code of honor, which subsequently adopted by later hardboiled, which was subsequently adopted by later hardboiled writers. Spade, as Mitzi M. Burnsdale writes, is an oblivious is oblivious to any kind of sentiment or softness, unafraid of death, unfettered by desire for wealth, and unaffected by the lure of sex. A number of writers followed Hammett's example with lesser or greater success. In The Simple Art of Murder, Raymond Chandler gave his famous definition of the hardball detective. But down these mean streets, a man must go who, who is not himself mean, who is neither tarnished nor afraid. The, defect, the detective in this kind of story must be such a man. He is the hero, he is everything. He must be a complete man and a common man, and yet an unusual man. He must be, to use rather weathered phrase, a man of honor. Based on the above blueprint, he created Philip Marlowe, a tough-talking PI with a drinking problem. James, M James Kane's Frank Chambers twisted the blueprint to show the romantic, hard criminal who falls in love with his own gendered fantasies and self-idealizations. These historical and pivotal, pivotal texts created a foundational script for the genre with misogyny and sexualized violence towards women woven into the fabric of the tradition. From this, Dorothy Hughes and Vera Casperi know the masculine tradition they have inherited, yet they are deeply critical of the genre they know they are writing through. They powerfully mel melded um, this traditionally masculine genre created by Chandler, Hammond, and Kane with a perceptive commentary on gender and class issues of their time. Their novels consistently defy what were then conventional notions of womanhood by creating archetype-breaking male and female characters. Often critics ignore these female writers because they did not explicitly unite feminist and female detectives. But it's been my contention in this thesis that writers of the generation of Hughes and Casperi made revisions to the genre in a more subtle fashion. What emerged from women writers entering the hardboiled tradition started as early 
starting as early as the 1940s, is a politically charged commentary and protest that draws on the traditions of masculine hardboiled fiction. Casper and Hughes have taken words, performance, community, socioeconomic violence, and the power of interpretation to queer the conventions of the hardboiled tradition. Their revised PIs can thrive in this difficult and conflicted genre because they do not adhere to the conventions cre as created by Hammett, Chandler, and Kane. Conventions that shackled and brutalized masculinity and femininity. Instead, they propose new social frameworks and strategies designed to protect power and politics that would not come at the expense of women. Women writers of the hardball tradition like Casper and Hughes negotiated issues of gender and genre for feminist purposes using the established popular formula in order to investigate not only the topic of crime in their novels, but also the more general offenses in which the patriarchal power structure of contemporary society itself is potentially incriminated. Um, I would say also, I guess, as something I learned from this experience, um, both that the topic that you start with is not going to be the topic that you end with <laughs> at all. <laughs> and um, definitely take the working bibliography super seriously while working on it, or else in the last week you go into a panic because you don't remember where you cited anything. <laughs> so. <laughs> which is what happened to me. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Dan. <laughs> um, and, that's, yeah. um, uh, I want to start off by thanking the woman without whom this project would not have been possible or nearly as much fun, and that is my amazing advisor, Sheila Fisher. Uh, in my acknowledgments, I joke that if I sent her an email at 6.12 a.m., I would have a response by 6.14 a.m. Uh, she's just that good. Um, and then I also think that if I sent any of my thesis questions into the world's fastest supercomputer, the supercomputer would have a slower response rate than Professor Fisher every time. Um, so thank you, Professor. Um, so I wrote my thesis on the Canterbury Tales, which uh, whenever I told people about my topic, people would be like, wow, Forrest, that's so impressive. Um, and I'm here to tell you now, my thesis has been an elaborate trick. Um, <laughs> because everyone is so terrified of middle English, if your argument is baloney, um, no one really calls you on it. <laughs> um, so that's, it's been nice to have that um, invulnerability as I went forward. Um, no. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, working on what is an absolutely canonical text, and I approach my thesis with that issue in mind. Why is the Canterbury Tales canonical? What makes it endure for us? And the answer that I came up with is intertextuality. Uh, the Canterbury Tales is remarkable because it presents us with a series of stories and storytellers that interact with and gain meaning from one another. And many of the tales, if they were considered in isolation, would be considered fantastic. Um, any reader could approach the Miller's Tale and the Miller's Tale alone and say, that's an amazing fablio. Um, thankfully, we don't have to read the tales alone. We get to enjoy them in the full richness of their context. And so, as I was approaching Chaucer, I wanted to look at the interactions among the stories and the storytellers as the main locus of um, Chaucer's most, I think, thought-provoking and original content. Um, so definitely the interaction among the pilgrims is a deeply competitive one, and that begins from the very general prologue, um, the very beginning of the work, uh, in which the host outlines the competition. The whole reason they're telling stories is the hope of getting a free dinner at the end of it. And I think that that is one way in which that competitive tone is laid out, but it doesn't really take form until the competition itself gets underway. And um, that happens after the night. The first storyteller tells his story, and the miller bursts forth from the pilgrimage train, and he says, um, I have a noble tale for the occasion, which with, with which I will now queet the knight's tale. And that Middle English word queet really came to be the centerpiece of my thesis. Um, in modern English, it means to repay um, or to match. And so the way that pilgrims queet one another is that they adopt and adapt various elements of previous storytellers in the hope of improving upon that work. And um, that, really, that became the, um, the main word in my title, and it became um, a word in every single one of my chapter titles as well. Um, 
because I think it sums up this kind of competitive revision that's going on among the pilgrims. Um, here's where I want to apologize for those of you who attended the December reading, because I'll be rehashing some, some information I shared then. The biggest breakthrough in my project undoubtedly came when I realized that the kind of queeting happening in the Canterbury Tales is not only going on among the pilgrims. Uh, Chaucer the poet is engaging in his own queeting process. Uh, instead of, um, you know, queeting someone else who you're riding along with uh, on the way to Canterbury, Chaucer is queeting his source authors. Uh, so for example, the Knight's Tale is based on Giovanni Boccaccio's uh, The Teseida, and so Chaucer uh, makes the Knight's Tale an adaptation of that, and in doing so, he identifies weaknesses in Boccaccio's work and seeks to improve upon them. And so uh, that first kind of became an afterthought, this idea that Chaucer is um, also engaging in his own queeting process, and in my final thesis, um, that takes up two-thirds of it. Um, so it kind of grew from there. Uh, so my first chapter is all about that interaction between um, Chaucer and Boccaccio via the Knight's Tale, and then my second chapter, which is based on the Miller's Tale, um, that is all about how Chaucer examines the Fabliau genre, um, which for any of you who are not familiar with that term, it's um, a very kind of antiquated genre, um, very popular in, I think, 13th century France, it's full of very body material. If you read the Canterbury Tales in high school, you might remember um, a certain character getting scalded in the butt with a hot poker. Um, and the Fablio are full of very kind of scatological and um, raunchy things like that. And uh, so Chaucer takes this genre that was very primitive, um, that was very much kind of just meant to be a light entertainment, and he stretches it to the limits of its potential in the Miller's Tale. So that's the way in which, uh, as he was queeting an author, a specific author through the Knight's Tale, he queets an entire genre uh, in the Miller's Tale. And then in my third chapter, I do a close reading analysis of the queeting between the Miller and the Knight, and I hope that that analysis was informed by my work with Chaucer's sources. So um, I'm going to just read you a brief section of my conclusion. Um, in the Writing Center, I always ask students to ask, so what? Um, why did I write this and what did I learn? Um, so this is my so what section in which I hope to make a case for why this approach to Chaucer is a valuable one. A queeting-based analysis is an invaluable approach to the study of the Canterbury Tales because by exploring the details of the competitive revision that dominates the text, critics and readers of Chaucer can glimpse an understanding of what he believed to be the hallmarks of an effective story. Because the process of queeting prompts the pilgrims to explore the very nature of how effective stories are made, we invariably get some idea of Chaucer's thoughts on the subject. In my study of queeting in The Knight's Tale and The Miller's Tale, the overarching theme that stood out to me is the idea I alluded to briefly at the end of chapter three, which you never read. Um, <laughs> And that idea is that genre is not destiny. In other words, no one genre is inherently superior to another. Instead, the success of any given story depends on the author's ability to work with and exploit the genre to its greatest effect. This notion seems particularly resonant when considered in the context of Chaucer's revision of the Fablio that I explored in chapter two. Pre-Chaucerian Fablio, with a, few exception, with a few exceptions, were not literary works of the highest quality. Before Chaucer's use of the genre in the Canterbury Tales, one might assume that the lack of quality in pre-Chaucerian Fabliau was the result of a fundamental deficit in the genre itself. However, Chaucer's Miller Miller's Tale, which is both a Fabliau and a highly successful work of art, shatters that notion. In other words, the excellence of the Miller's Tale seems to be a testament to the fact that any genre, however simplistic or broken it may appear, can be used to create a great work. This idea of genre not being destiny seems to be one that appears in other parts of the Canterbury Tales as well. For example, in what George Lyman Kitteridge defines as the marriage group, we may note that although each tale within this group deals with the subject of marriage, each tale belongs to a different genre. The Life of Bath's Tale is an Arthurian romance, The Clerk's Tale is a morality play, The Merchant's Tale is a fablio, and The Franklin's Tale is a Breton lay. Each tale is firmly rooted in one of four distinct genres. However, they are all used to treat one common theme, that of marriage. An examination of the marriage group suggests that these differences in genre are the reason Chaucer is able to explore the theme of marriage with such nuance and originality. In other words, the grouping of these disparate types of stories, rather than being a liability, is in reality an asset. We may be so bold as to expand this idea to speculate more broadly on Chaucer's artistic inclinations. Chaucer's choices throughout the Canterbury Tales suggest a belief that there is no such thing as unsuitable material for a particular genre. 
Any author can use any given genre to treat any subject effectively, so long as one, the author is intimately aware of the strengths, weaknesses, and demands of the genre, and two, the author is willing to approach the undertaking with an attitude of ingenuity and experimentation. If these stipulations are met, it may be the case that the most unexpected pairings between genre and subject matter often produce the most compelling works of storytelling. Thank you. Um, as for what I learned, oh gosh. I would say don't leave proofreading until 24 hours before the deadline. Um, that would definitely be a big one. Um, the other I would say is that I think Professor Bilson put a pin on this last night. Allow the thesis to germinate um, because even though you might not get a lot of words on the page early on, or you might not even get words that you'll eventually use, uh, it's amazing how quickly um, the thesis can take shape later on in the process when you've been treating these ideas for months on end. So, um, thank you and Bridget Riley will be next. a very tough act to follow. I would say I don't want to follow it, but actually, <laughs> Forrest, it's a real privilege, and it's been a real privilege to just be in the colloquium with all of you guys. You're really wonderful, so thank you. Um, and before I begin, I'd also like to thank Professor Rosen. Um, I really don't like the phrase, I couldn't have done it without you, because it seems a little hollow. But so far as this thesis goes, it's really true. Um, and I've tried to thank you many times. Um, but I always find that my, my words are inadequate to explain the immense amount of gratitude I have for everything you've done for me this year. So thank you. Anyway, um, now to the funny stuff. Uh, <laughs> so a few days ago, I actually went to talk to Professor Rosen to get some advice about what I should say for the presentation. And he asked, well, what exactly do you have to do? And I said, you know, well, I have to start by giving a one to two minute summary of the whole project. And at this he goes, Haha, ha, good luck. <laughs> so, <laughs> here it goes. Um, it's titled, There's a Wisdom That is Woe, Knowledge Through Narrative in Milton, Coleridge, and Melville. Um, and more specifically, I'm looking at Paradise Lost, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, and Moby Dick. Um, and within those works, I'm focusing on the narrators. So Raphael for Paradise Lost, the Mariner in the Marginal Voice for the Rhyme, and Ishmael, of course, for Moby Dick. Um, and sort of the premise I'm working off of is that through their respective narrators, each author is consciously grappling with the fact that language never perfectly or at times adequately explains the subject they're dealing with. And because of this, their subjects can never be completely understood either by them or by their audience. Now for a writer, I imagine this would be what, call, what Ishmael calls a poor pickle, or <laughs> as my mom would say it, a major problemo. <laughs> so the question I was trying to answer in the thesis was, how does each of these authors deal with this problem? Um, and I think they use their narrators to establish what a narrative told in an imperfect way is actually good for. I think they're trying to explain in some dim random way how and why telling stories helps us live meaningful, good, and productive lives. Um, and I think they were aware of what the author before them, or in Melville's case, the authors that came before them had to say about that, and they were building off of that. Except for Milton, who doesn't seem to have listened to anybody, just seems to be that kind of guy. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna jump to the very end, which is actually the one thing Professor Rosen told me not to do for the presentation. <laughs> I'm not going to listen to you. <laughs> um, and in it, I talk about uh, comedy and sort of Ishmael's sense of humor. Um, and sort of, I feel that's Melville's addition to sort of the discussion that Milton starts with Raphael um, in Paradise Lost. And sort of, I think he thinks that the failings of language actually permit a comedic improvisation um, that allows us to be funny. Um, yeah, and I'm going to end here, not because I think it's the best argument are the most interesting point, but because I like the idea of ending the whole year with a laugh. So anyway, um, the idea that Ishmael acts as the main comedic force in the novel is not new. In his Moby Dick, a work of art by Walter E. Benzanson, um, Benzanson analyzes Ishmael's temperament and concludes 
that one of his most striking features is his ability to laugh. I would suggest Melville saw comedy working in the rhyme through the marginal voice and in Paradise Lost and concluded it was a resource that his predecessors had not fully managed to tap. Through Ishmael, Melville articulates the comedic benefit narrative can provide. Ishmael's comedy is finally Melville's original contribution to the discussion started by Raphael two centuries before. Compared to Moby Dick, both the rhyme and Paradise Lost seem humorless. However, the moments in which these works have comedic potential are the strains that I believe Melville played close attention to when creating Ishmael. While the rhyme itself is not very funny, the accompanying misinterpretations provided by the pompous marginal voice can be quite hilarious, especially when viewed in juxtaposition to the Mariner's bizarre, confusing, and at times gruesome tale. The Raphael dialogues are about as funny as Paradise Lost gets. <laughs> perhaps, pictures, pic, perhaps picturing Satan's descent into the yawning mouth of hell is less horrible when you consider that just moments before, angels were playing with old-fashioned cannons and hurling mountains at one another. Huh. While Milton probably did not intend Raphael to be as funny as modern readers now find him, his dialogues are the only books within the epic that are not entirely preoccupied with the fall. While the first half of book six is dominated by Satan's sin, and the other books, the other books celebrate life in Eden and the wonders of creation and the joy of telling stories. However, the post-lapsarian reader also knows that Raphael's mission will fail. She knows that no matter what Raphael says, the world will end up the way Michael foresees it in book 12. In compensation, Milton provides a slightly comedic interlude that separates the horrors from hell from the horrors of the fallen world. At the end of the Raphael dialogues, Milton depicts a comic exchange between Raphael and Adam about love. Like Michael, who offers Adam the solace of the scriptures, Milton seems to offer this comedic scene as a fleeting solace for the pain and suffering the reader knows is about to come. About to come. <clears throat> After a stimulating conversation about the sublimity of outer space and creation, Adam and Raphael turn their attention to more Edenic matters. Adam, half abashed, begins talking about his feelings for Eve. After he admits that nothing so much delights him as those graceful acts, Adam becomes overwhelmed with embarrassment. He quickly redirects the conversation by asking Raphael, love not the heavenly spirits and how their love express thee. In response to Adam's probing question, Raphael begins to glow celestial rosy red. <laughs> he briefly explains that because angels have no bodies, if spirits embrace, totally they mix, in union pure with pure. It is on this note that the blushing Raphael suddenly decides to end the lengthy conversation and zip back up to heaven. Although the two participating in the conversation fumble awkwardly, it is hard for the post lapsian reader not to chuckle over the pair's prudishness. However, the comedic scene is shadowed by the thought that within the epic, this laughter comes at the expense of Adam's and later all of humanity's happiness. While Milton offers a fleeting glimpse of happiness and a chance for momentary laughter, the epic begins and ends with the terrors of the fallen world. By the time Adam and Eve take their solitary way, tragedy has sufficiently stifled any chuckles that Raphael's discourse has provided. While Michael's scriptural, scriptural solution might bring the fallen couple hope, it sure does not bring back the laughs. While comedy has a limited precedent presence in Paradise Lost, it is the primary mode in which Ishmael narrates his experience in Moby Dick. Ishmael takes us out of the murky waters of Miltonic comedy. By offering us comedy as an alternative to Ahab's tragic storyline and suggesting that laughter is a necessary safeguard against the sublime horrors of the sea, Ishmael fu fully endorses what his angelic predecessor never fully or intentionally condones. In Moby Dick, tragedy, specifically the catastrophic end of the Pequod, only enhances Ishmael's comedy and makes it all the more necessary. While Ishmael's comedic interludes are littered throughout the novel, nowhere is comedy more value, comedy's more value more apparent than in the monkey rope. In this chapter, Ishmael washes from the deck as Queequeg, who is attached to him by a rope, flounders about, half on the whale, half in the sea. While Queequeg slips about on the whale and sharks chomp at his ankles, Tashigo and Dagu flourish over his head a couple of keen whale spades, wherewith they slaughter as many sharks as they can reach. Ishmael worriedly considers Queequeg's dire situation, but in true Ishmaelian fashion, he soon zooms out from the scene before him and begins to contemplate its deeper philosophical significance. In a humor-filled tone, he says, Well, well, my dear comrade and twin brother, 
thought I, as I drew in and then slacked off the rope to every swell of the sea. What matters it, after all? Are you not a precious image of each of all us men in this roiling world? What that unsounded ocean you grasp in is life. Those sharks, your foes. Those spades, your friends. And what between sharks and spades, you are in a sad pickle and peril, poor lad. <laughs> Ishmael paints us a dismal picture of life and the world we live in. However, he does not dwell on the horrible implications of his conclusions. Directly after Queequeg clambers up from the whale, Doughboy rushes over and hands him a cup of hot cognac? No, hands him ye gods, hands him a cup of tepid ginger water. <laughs> in the scene that ensues, Stubb comes thundering in to admonish Doughboy, who we later learn had received the ginger water from Aunt Charity, who had intended to make the Pequod a floating model of temperance. Needless to say, <laughs> the slapstick scene ends with Stubb reappearing with a dark flask in hand and a sort of tea caddy in the other. The first contained strong spirits and was handed to Queequeg. The second was Aunt Charity's gift, and that was given freely to the waves. After setting us down to contemplate the sharkish world around us, Ishmael yanks us back from, the hopeless, hope, back from hopeless peril and provides us with the one consolation he can. No, not Stubb's cognac, but laughter. Ishmael's humor does not simply reside in these slapstick scenes. It's apparent in every event that he relates, and it is the defining characteristic of his narrative voice. While the world may be filled with some unknown thing, some danger that he cannot express, Ishmael still laughs, something neither Milton nor Coleridge managed to do. While they both note the benefits that a fallible language can provide, they always come up against the same wall. While narrative can make us better, it cannot bring us back. Therefore, within Coleridge's and Milton's works, the exchange of narrative is always imbued with a certain amount of anxiety and, and nostalgia. The mariner can only convey terrible truths perfectly to one select individual, and Raphael's stories in the end do not prevent the fall. Melville's predecessors are so preoccupied with what has been the perfect state that has been lost that they do not fully embrace how wonderful the inadequacies of language can be. Unconcerned with what has been lost, Melville finds something quite amazing. The failures of language are liberating. They can function as a springboard for improvisation and humor. They allow him to be funny. With no innocence to lose and no God to disappoint, Ishmael adopts humor as a mode of telling not because he must, but because he can. Through Ishmael, Melville suggests that we can laugh not only despite the vast unknown world, but because of it. There we are with Ishmael, bobbing in the immense sublimity of the sea. How strange, how funny, how true. So as far as what I learned, um, <laughs> why is it so hard? <laughs> um, I would say one of the things I learned is that I had a tendency to flatten the texts I was working with to try to like shove them into my argument. And while I believed in my argument, I do think I didn't do the text's complete amount of justice. So I, I just go in with the idea that that's okay because it's only a one year project. So yeah, it is what it is. And just be zen with that. <laughs> so yeah, just be, yeah, just be comfortable with that, I guess. I mean, that's what I have to tell myself. <laughs> so that's what I'll tell somebody else. And next we have Michaela Powers. Um, I also want to start by saying a few thank yous to my advisor. I mean, to my friends and family who came today. Um, and mom, please don't take any pictures. <laughs> That's all I ask. Um, so my thesis was titled Mistaken Impulses of Undisciplined Hearts, Marriage Plot Adaptations in Jane Eyre, David Copperfield, and Basil, which I will mispronounce at some point and say Basil, but it is Basil. <laughs> Um, it's an examination of the tensions and anxieties that disrupt the conventional marriage plot. And I looked primarily at three mid-century Victorian novels um, in an attempt to understand how the authors reconciled the ideal of companionate marriage, so marrying for love, um, with the realities of Victorian society, um, the things that work against that arrangement. So if you're 
previously in history, people had been marrying for economic reasons. Um, you choose a spouse more based on their family or the, if their field is next to yours, you're not marrying based on love. Uh, so I found that the authors creatively resolved, explored, and navigated these issues um, brought forth by the Proud Dilemma using the marriage plot as a narrative framework. Uh, my thesis then addressed two primary questions. Um, how did authors manage to resolve social anxieties about the disconnect between an emerging cultural ideal of romantic love um, and the changing social reality? And how and in what way did the marriage plot, re marriage plot evolve in reaction to broader cultural and social shifts? Um, so it's difficult to sum up the answer in a sentence, but I found that at a time where marriages were increasingly based on choice, the novels perhaps suggest that these choices should be guided by a search, not for a difference in chaos, but rather sameness in order. So I found that the um, heroes and heroines married people that were similar to them, so they searched for a sameness of values in their partners. Um, and today I'll be focusing on my second chapter, and, and trying to answer this question in that it didn't really turn out the way I anticipated. Um, when I presented in December, I did not think I would be writing about brothers and sisters marrying each other, but that was how it worked out. That's how the question was answered. Um, so I'll be reading um, the introduction to my second section um, entitled A Talisman About His Heart, Sister Marriage in David Copperfield and Basil. Many 19th century novels represent a curious phenomenon. Brothers either marrying women like their sisters or living with their sisters in romantic relationships. In David Copperfield, for example, David marries his adopted sister, finding a happiness that eluded him during his unsuitable first marriage. And in Wilkie Collins' Basil, the main character chooses to live with his blood sister, Clara, at the end of the novel, instead of remarrying following the death of his first wife. Basil's relationship with Clara is passionately romantic, even sexual, as often noticed in critical conversations surrounding the text. This remarkable phenomenon needs to be understood as a reaction to a number of social and cultural shifts, particularly intense, an intense idealization of the brother-sister relationship in the 19th century. Sisters were so glorified by authors of fiction and conduct literature that they were presented as suitable, even desirable choices for marital partners, something that is pretty much escaped on critical and scholarly attention so far. Incredibly virtuous, faithfully devoted, and domestically skilled, sisters embodied all the desirable traits of a perfect wife. Time and time again, the relationship is held up by the ideal, as the ideal relation between young men and women, so much so that marriage itself was often, often resent, represented ideally as a sibling relationship. Um, both novels have what I term the sister marriage model where the male protagonist marries their sister or sister figure because only they can fit the desired model of ideal Victorian middle-class wifehood. The sister marriage plot is an example of the author's rethinking romantic marriage, allowing them to simultaneously <coughs> express dissatisfaction with normative Victorian marriage and their attempt to define a better model. My chapter, my chapter will address the uses and functions of sister marriage in the two novels and its function within the la larger narrative particularly in terms of how it affects narrative resolution. The relationships in Basil and David Copperfield need to be read as sister marriages, as I shall, sh as I shall show, as the sister marriage plot better explains the seemingly unsatisfactory marriages and resolutions in the novel. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit um, to the section where I discuss um, Basil by Wilkie Collins. So Basil recounts the disastrous love affair of a young, upper-class man and his attempts to repair his life following his marriage's demise. When Basil's first wife, Margaret, dies of typhus following the exposure of her infidelity, he returns home to his sister Clara's recently um, inherited country estate, seeking restoration, but he decides to remain indefinitely with her. Basil and his sister live together, virtually alone on the isolated estate, presumably for the remainder of their lives. Prior to this self-imposed exile, Basil strove to achieve an illustrious writing career and a degree of fame, but these, as, these aspirations essentially vanish once he retreats to the country. The conditions of the narrator's return to normalcy after his marriage's failure have puzzled critics and readers alike, most often producing negative reactions, like that of critic Tamar Heller. Heller argues that Basil is trapped in a pointlessly liminal world between action and repose at the conclusion of the novel. 
The domestic space has a stifling effect on his writing career, Heller argues, because it represents a return to the Gothic maternal tradition that, threat, that wishes to silence and overwrite the male voice. Clara is responsible for en engendering and sustaining the maternal tradition, so her interrupting presence harms Basil emotionally and creatively. However, Heller's re reading dismisses the positive effects of Clara's unwavering support and encouragement of all of his literary and romantic pursuits. I will argue that the unsettling conclusion can be better understood if Clara and Basil's bond is viewed within the context of the sister marriage plot. Their relationship at the conclusion is not one of platonic companionship. It is a pseudo marriage. Um, Clara is not just Basil's sister, she, Basil's sister, she is essentially his <laughs> wife. <laughs> Clara is repeatedly depicted as a potential and more suitable marital partner for Basil because of her sisterly qualities. I propose that Margaret's purpose in the novel is to highlight Clara's superiority as a wife and as a sister. The reveal of her true character directs Basil to his right wife. Um, Margaret serves as, as an example of a bad sister who the narrator then misidentifies and mislabels as a good one. Um, my, reader, my reading alters traditional readings of the marriage plot as I believe that Basil and, Basil and Mar Margaret's relationship cannot be understood as the primary marriage plot because it does not offer the resolution of the sister marriage. Basil's choice of Clara as his wife at the novel's conclusion demonstrates the privileging of the sister marriage plot over the traditional marriage plot, depicting the former as a more effective model for producing a successful happy marriage. And my advice, like Forrest, best advice I can give is not to leave the proofreading to the end, as my friends and teammates can attest to. Thank you for proofreading. Um, and also not to leave the footnotes to the end, because you will forget what you wanted to say, and there'll be a little number at the bottom of the page, and you'll have no idea what you wanted to write. That's it. Thank you. And up next is Maddie. Um, so first I also want to start by giving a shout out to our amazing colloquium and Professor Bilston um, and also to my advisor Dr. Dan. Thank you so much for everything. Um, and I was thinking about it and since we turned in our thesis, which you know was a very stressful thing all year, I have not stopped showing up at Dr. Dan's office hours every week. So um, clearly you made the process at least a little bit enjoyable. Um, so I'm going to start by reading a section from my introduction. Um, the title of my thesis was The Thing That Made Her Beautiful and Not Us, Visible Identity and Postmodern Emotion in Contemporary American Fiction. In her book, Visible Identities, Linda Alcoff critiques the relationship between appearance and identity in our modern American society. As a result of an inherently materialistic capitalist model, our culture equates the visible with the true. Born out of this equation is the unspoken yet widespread belief that physical appearance invariably indicates identity and that in turn all aspects of identity can be uncovered with sufficiently close observation of one's physical appearance. Alkov, Alkov notes that this belief is especially problematic when it comes to race and gender as these factors are seen as both intrinsic to identity and visibly discernible based on physical features of the body. This notion is made viscerally, horrifyingly literal in Toni Morrison's first novel, The Bluest Eye, which, since its original publication in 1970, has become a seminal work in the arena of modern American literature. The Bluest Eye initiates a tradition of critiquing not only the racist and sexist undercurrents of society's ideals, but also the notion that appearance defines identity and that certain bodies, and therefore certain people, are inherently better than others. So in my thesis, I situate Look at Me by Jennifer Egan and Your Face and Mine by Jess Rowe, within a canon of postmodern works in dialogue with the bluest eye and the way it constructs the emotional stakes of developing a sense of selfhood in a society that equates physical appearance and essentialized identity. So each of these novels constructs a different framework through which it grapples with the problems of visible identity. In The Bluest Eye, um, Morrison enacts a sharp critique of the racism inherent in capitalist culture to forge a space in her society for black identity to thrive. Look at Me explores the relationship between aesthetic surface level and interior fragmentation in a rapidly digitizing economy, ultimately suggesting that a return to genuine emotion can engender a stable sense of identity. In Your Face and My Mine, Roe engages in academically obsessed, extremely self-reflexive story storytelling 
um, to find a means of accessing authenticity in an artificially constructed world. In my thesis, I argue that the way these writers dramatize the notion of visible identity as a problem in postmodern society, even when applied to people in positions of privilege, indicates a trend more pervasive than what Alcoff imagines. Through their literary representations of the emotional stakes of visible identity, Morrison, Egan, and Rowe all enact a resistance to the ubiquitous and destructive role that visibility has assumed in postmodern society. So today, um, I'll be reading a section from the introduction of my second chapter, which is entitled, My Words, My World, Visible Identity and Authenticity in Jess Rowe's Your Face and Mine. In Your Face and Mine, Jess Rowe imagines a not, a not so far off future in which technological advancements allow people to literally transform their identities and become someone else by drastically altering their physical appearances. The story is presented through a first person narration of its protagonist, Kelly Thorndike, who has returned to his hometown, home, hometown of Baltimore after a car crash kills his wife, a Chinese woman named Wendy, and their, do, and their young daughter, Mei Mei. In the novel's first scene, Kelly walks down the street and spots a black man who strikes him as uncannily familiar. It is only when the man addresses him by name that Kelly recognizes him as his close childhood friend, Martin, who the last time the narrator saw him was 19 years old and white. Martin explains that he has become involved in pioneering an up-and-coming cosmetic procedure called racial reassignment surgery. He attempts to hire Kelly as a ghostwriter to tell his transformation story, or in Martin's own words, to spring it on the world the way it needs to be done. Kelly is skeptical, but agrees to review some materials on the procedure, and soon becomes intertwined in a strange enterprise attempting to commodify and sell racial identity. Um, although the entirety of the story is told from Kelly's first-person perspective, the novel as a whole is comprised of a variety of narrative sources that create fragmentation <laughs> and add to its postmodern character. <coughs> For instance, a large portion of Martin's backstory and explanations of racial re reassignment are told through the beginnings of a book describing his self-diagnosed condition, the psychological reports that he and the surgeon behind racial reassignment surgery produce, and the tape recordings in which he reflects on his journey to his new identity. In some ways, Kelly's story functions, functions as a framing device for Martin's narrative, which in fact is precisely Martin's goal in involving Kel Kelly in his business venture. The novel also reflects the postmodern aesthetic and its extreme self-reflexivity, um, which often manifests in metafictional references to theory, academia, and the nature of narrative itself. The novel's ending, which culminates in Kelly's racial reassignment and assumption of a new Chinese identity, arises abruptly in the wake of his skepticism of the procedure throughout the story. During the course of the novel, he is shaped by his interactions with self-aware postmodern characters who double as discursive devices for contending ideologies. Late in the story, he encounters a Korean trained white academic named Julie Na, who discourages him from undergoing the procedure. Martin and Julie Na in particular represent not only symbolically, but also literally through their straightforward dialogue, opposing ends of a spectrum of theoretical discourse surrounding questions of appearance, identity, and truth. The first section of this chapter discusses how Martin, at one end of the, se the spectrum, represents a move away from authenticity. Although he begins at what seems to be a place of sincere emotion, likening, likening the feeling of belonging among, among the family of a black friend during his childhood to feeling like part of the human world, his entire identity eventually becomes a commodity designed to be reproduced and sold. In the second section of this chapter, I show how Julie Na, at the, end of, at the other end of the spectrum, symbolizes movement on an opposite tra trajectory. Her desire to change her race originates in her early exposure to idealized representations of white beauty in the movies. She begins with the desire for de-individualization to more closely resemble the cultural industry's mass-produced images of feminine beauty. Unlike Martin, however, she regrets her transformation. By the time Kelly encounters her in the novel, she has become an adamant critic of racial reassignment, presenting it as a barrier to truth. The third and final section of this chapter, then, analyzes how Kelly, who engages in profound ideological conversations with both these characters, must sculpt his own beliefs in order to make a life-altering decision. So um, my piece of advice is, I don't know how helpful it's gonna be because I received this advice myself and did not follow it, but <laughs> you should follow it. Um, and that is to do your reading over the summer because <laughs> you'll regret it if you don't. Um, and next up is Julia Callahan. Hi, 
Hi. Um, I'd also like to thank our thesis colloquium. Uh, I think that you know you guys were the support group that we all needed, um, and also my advisor, Professor Barry, um, for helping more than I could have ever imagined, and also for giving me the super fun year-long challenge of learning to read your handwriting. <laughs> um, so. My thesis um, considers the poetry of Robert Pinsky, Philip Levine, and Yusef Kumanyaka by looking at their work in terms of the civil and Vatic poetic impulses and the need to bear witness through poetry. So according to Edward Mendelssohn in the introduction to his biography, Early Auden, poets who write in the civil sphere feel an obligation to speak to the public, while those who write in the Vatic tradition concern, them, concern themselves more with private matters and emotions. And many critics acknowledge that poets feel um, an anxiety towards responsibility or um, a desire to address political issues, but some argue that addressing such events doesn't follow the creative process of poetry. So my thesis engages with the work of Pinsky, Levine, and Kumanyaka to illustrate how the ideas of witness operate in these three poets and to understand how they use witness in, dif in different ways as a means to answer the call of poetic responsibility. Um, in my first chapter, I argue that Levine and Kumanyaka bear witness by striking balances between the Vatican simple and civil impulses in their poetry, and that they do so by using personal experiences to discuss larger cultural issues. Uh, I argue that by writing about their own life events in their collections, What Work Is and Dian Kaidao, Levine and Kumanyaka leave their personal marks of judgment on the times so um, as to become witnesses for future generations. And then in my second chapter, I argue that Pinsky bears witness in his poetry by engaging directly with civil poetry as a form of cultural criticism. Uh, Pinsky's focus on language, or more specifically, the ability of language to capture accurately emotion and tragedy, demonstrates a need to understand the effects of catastrophe on the poetic imagination. Um, and the ways in which we use and abuse language, the limits of language, and the co-option of language by the media and larger cultural forces, often for political purposes, all complicate the poet's ability to deal with large-scale catastrophes. So for Pinsky, witness is not inherently connected to personal experience, as it is for Levine and Kumanyaka, but when the personal intersects with the political in a way that allows the poet to fulfill his sense of civil obligation, then the poet is able to bear witness uh, by making poems that hold public weight. So the section that I'll read today is from the second half of chapter one, where I discuss Kumanyaka's mode of witness. Um, it's a close reading of the poem To Do Street, um, which I chose to do because, not because I think that it best sums up my project, but because throughout this process, um, that's what I've had the most fun doing is close reading all of these poems. So um, the stockpile of unresolved conflict that is Kumanyaka's war memories manifests itself in the poem To Do Street in a way that reveals Kumanyaka's shifting feelings over race, as well, as well as many of the horrifying actions he experiences in Vietnam. To Do Street illustrates the distance that white and black American soldiers are forced to maintain in their free time, but also the ease with which this divide breaks down when they find a shared humanity in the company of Vietnamese prostitutes. In the poem, Kumanyaka recalls childhood memories of segregation in Louisiana, as the white-only signs from his memory mimic those he sees in a bar in Vietnam. The mama-san behind the counter acts as if she can't understand Kumanyaka's order because he is black, and he finds himself traveling deeper into alleys where he can enjoy the company of a prostitute on a non-discriminatory basis. According to Alvin Albert, <coughs> the title of the poem acts as a play on the words for Two Door Street to illustrate the nature of the segregation. Bars separate the black and white soldiers and force them to find prostitutes in different locations, but once they find this company, they find a shared humanity. There's more than a nation inside us, as black and white soldiers touch the same lovers, minutes apart, tasting each other's breath. The soldiers inadvertently share the same women, women whose brothers and the machine gun fire they inspire bring the soldiers together. Though they are separated based on the color of their skin, they are all men with the same desires and needs who find themselves in the company of the same women. Black, white, and yellow intertwine to show the, inter the deep interrelatedness of human beings in wartime. However, Kumanyaka does not present the, un the union between black and white as genuine, but rather as very problematic. In engaging with the same women, the black and white soldiers become equally human, but the fact that they only find this commonality through purchase sex is deeply ironic. The irony runs even deeper than sex, though. As critics such as Stein and William Bear note, this shared humanity comes at a price. 
The connection that the black and white soldiers share leads them to the same underworld. Uh, soldiers taste each other's breath without knowing that these rooms run into each other like tunnels leading to the underworld. Stein observes that the use of figurative tunnels to link the soldiers harkens back to the deadly maze of tunnels the Viet Cong used to ferry supplies to fight and quickly disappear, and into which many American soldiers ventured never to return. The tunnels that link black and white equally in sex also lead them equally to death. When asked about this poem in a 1998 interview with William Baer, Kumanyaka speaks of the confusing psychic space of the GI and the underworlds that soldiers in Vietnam created in their own minds. He says, there were many symbolic underworlds in Vietnam, the underground tunnel systems, some of the bars, and the whole psychic space of the GI, a kind of, a kind of underworld populated by ghosts and indefinable images. It was a place of emotional and psychological flux, where one was trying to make sense out of the world and one's place in that world. And there was, relentlessly, a going back and forth between that internal space and the external world. It was an effort to deal with oneself, with the other GIs, with the Vietnamese, and even with the ghosts that we'd managed to create ourselves. So for me, this is a very complex picture of the, situ of the situation of the GI, the going back and forth, condemned in a way to trek back and forth between those emotional demarcations while still trying to make sense out of things. Kumanyaka's attempt to maintain his sanity in Vietnam reflects his need to write this collection. He tells To Do Street from the first person perspective and phrases such as, I close my eyes, I walk, and I look, exemplify his position as a witness. Through this flashback style poem, Kumanyaka records what he has done and suggests that those actions have constructed the person that he became. Through the process of remembering these emotions and recording them in his collection, Kumanyaka gives up this psychologically haunted person. He channels his mental turmoil into beautiful, although at times very disturbing, poems that equalize his inner and outer selves. Um, and some advice or something that I learned would be um, to know that at some point on April 14th, to be exact, um, the editing process has to end. And your project, although you might not think that it's done, um, is going to be the best that it's going to be at that point and just to know that um, that's the best you could do up to that point and that's worth something. Um, and up next is Maddie Burns. So I wanted to start out by thanking people again, so thanking my thesis colloquium and Professor Bilston for leading it. Um, I couldn't have completed this project without that support network. Um, and then I also wanted to thank my advisor, Professor Hager, who unfortunately can't be here today, but um, this project wouldn't exist without him. So, uh, My thesis explores the formal, experimental poetry of three female writers, Emily Dickinson, Gertrude Stein, and H.D., each of whom I believe wields substantial influence in the canon of formal, experimental American female poets. Through an analysis of their experimentation with poetic form, I discuss each poet's primary objectives as a woman writing experimental literature and how those individual objectives merge as a collective attempt to defy the traditional, gendered, heteronormative, and patriarchal norms of their time. The chapters are ordered chronologically, beginning with Emily Dickinson, followed by Gertrude Stein, and concluding with H.D., so as to explicate patterns of in influence between the three poets. Each poet's approach to formal experimentation functions as a response to the style of the poet before her, where Dickinson is more accepting of language and presents it in a new ways to tell all the truth but tell it slant. Stein rejects traditional language structures and emphasizes the ideas of beginning again and making it new, where Stein starts over, uh, stripping away the meaning of words and reconstructing new meanings. H.D. embraces ancient forms of language and literature and integrates these structures through experimentation with form in her poetry. So the short excerpt that I'm going to read for you guys today um, comes from my Stein chapter uh, in a section on cookbook language where I talk about how Stein uses that particular style of language um, and writing to assert female authority and subvert heteronormative structures. Just as Dickinson references the domestic fear, sphere in her poetry in order to expose chauvinistic ideologies, Stein uses traditional domestic texts to employ counter-normative ideas and establish impressions of female authority. In her article, Familiar Strangers, the Household Words of Gertrude Stein's Tender Buttons, 
Marguerite Murphy maintains that the short, truncated sentences that Stein employs throughout Tender Buttons create a tone of authority by mimicking the style of home magazines and cookbooks popular for women at the time. Unlike Dickinson, who frequently asserts ideas of female authority using the first person, Stein shies away from the first person and instead uses the impersonal style of what Murphy refers to as cookbook language. This impersonal and direct rhetoric is essentially, especially apparent under the section food, where many phrases resemble a collage of language from cookbooks and home magazines. Seat a knife near a cage and a very near a decision, a more ne nearly a timely working cat and scissors. Do this temporarily and make no more, st more mistake in standing. Spread it all and arrange the white place. Does this show in the house? Does it not show in the green? That is not necessary for that color. Does it not even show in the explanation and singularly not all that is stationary? These chaotic directives and shortened phrases replicate the style of cookbooks which assume that women already have a certain amount of knowledge about domestic tasks and omit certain steps and phrases suggesting that this shorthand of cookbooks and magazines is a language of its own to which only women are party. These direct commands such as seat a knife, do this temporarily, and spread it all are juxtaposed with an indecisive rhetoric as the speaker questions how to arrange certain colors in the home. Does this show in the house? Does it not show in the green? Showing the weight of society's judgment on women's decisions within the domestic sphere. Murphy argues that the authority of Stein's female voice imitates the form of domestic guides to living, cookbooks, housekeeping guides, books of etiquette, guides to entertaining, maxims of interior design, fashion advice, which allows her to portray her own idiosyncratic domestic arrangement by using and displacing the authoritative discourse of a conventional woman's world. Stein takes a familiar vocabulary and style of rhetoric, typically written by women and for women, to hi both highlight the value of women's power within the domestic sphere, but also to denigrate the gendering of the domestic sphere. She simultaneously uses and displaces the, uses and displaces the authoritative discourse of the conventional woman's world by both using this cookbook style as a source of female authority and also recognizing the ways in which this style of rhetoric surrounding the domestic sphere limits women. So my advice you're not going to like, but it's to write every single week. Uh, Professor Hager made me do it, and I hated him for it, but <laughs> you'd rather have excess pages at the end that you don't use than not have enough when it comes to the last day. So um, that would be my advice, and I'm the last reader, so thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>